So from an architecture perspective, um, this is typically how it will look. You can make it a little different than this, um, but this is kind of the, the simplified version. Um, there's a couple different steps here, um, but the idea is that you would have a client application or a website uh, shown there at the bottom and then have a backend server that is communicating with MoneyGram uh, and you know, doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And so, for example, one way you could build this out is have the wallet um, you know, ping your backend server asking to initiate a transaction uh, and the backend server can authenticate with MoneyGram using SEP10, uh, provide that API credential back and initiate that withdrawal. Uh, and when you initiate that withdrawal, MoneyGram would return a URL to then be opened in the application. Uh, when that happens and that flow completes, again, because it's a little bit of a black box for the application, that's where MoneyGram actually uh, is the one that controls the user experience. Um, after that process is complete, the wallet uh, or exchange server can send funds uh, to MoneyGram. And this is the case of a withdrawal. In the case of a deposit, uh, this step happens at the very end, like after this, I guess, would be step seven. Um, but in the case of withdrawal, funds are sent to MoneyGram. Uh, and MoneyGram will give a reference number that the user can then use to pick up at a retail location. So let's dive deeper into uh, each step. And first, you obviously have to authenticate. Um, and the authentication process looks a bit different between Omnibus and individual accounts. So if, if you're using a custodian or you are the custodian of your user's funds, uh, your flow will look something like this. Uh, it's pretty simple. It involves two different requests uh, to MoneyGram server, one to request a authentication challenge, uh, and then one to provide that challenge back once that challenge has been uh, signed by the Omnibus account that you're in possession of. Um, so in this scheme, uh, the account that is being authenticated identifies the custodian or uh, the, the application that is tied to that single account. Uh, and it's actually a memo that's attached to the challenge transaction that identifies the individual user. So in the token that is returned to the application, uh, the account and the memo is specified in this credential. And that's how MoneyGram understands that not only is this particular wallet, this particular account that is associated with a uh, custodial service uh, is authenticated, but also the, a particular user identified by the memo uh, in association with that custodial service is the one that's authenticated. And this is key to understand because uh, the APIs that uh, MoneyGram and the wallet use to connect uh, are all based on the user's uh, individual data. So even though you're using a custodian or you are the custodian of your user's funds, uh, when you engage with MoneyGram, the uh, API access that you have is scoped to the user. So as a custodian, you can't ping MoneyGram and get the, the transactions of all your users. Um, you can only ping MoneyGram for the, trans, uh, the transactions of a single user. Uh, and this just helps uh, segment data, make sure that um, you know, you're not getting information that you probably shouldn't be handling and uh, vice versa. Uh, for individual accounts, uh, it's a little bit more complex. And the reason this is the case is because MoneyGram needs to know uh, who the wallet is, but because when you have individual accounts, the account doesn't represent the wallet, it actually represents the user. Um, so there needs to be another mechanism by which the wallet identifies themselves. Uh, and so the way this works is there's an additional call, uh, or sorry, an additional signature from an additional account that identifies the wallet. So in the previous slide, I'll just go back, there is really two signatures. There's uh, MoneyGram's signature on the challenge that identifies that MoneyGram is the one that issued this authentication challenge. Uh, and then the Omnibus account, uh, the custodian, signs that challenge with their account and sends it back, verifying that they are the custodian. Um, when you have an individual account, uh, you need to sign with those same two signatures, the uh, signature of MoneyGram and the signature from the individual user. But in order to identify the wallet that is facilitating this transaction, there needs to be an additional signature on that challenge. So the additional requests that are being made are to and from this wallet backend. Uh, the wallet in the individual account uh, case needs to host a Stellar Tomo file. And this Stellar Tomo file is just a plain text file hosted on a domain that is registered with MoneyGram um, or provided in the authentication request. And when this, uh, when this domain is passed to MoneyGram, 
MoneyGram will look up the, uh, the account on, in that file and verify that the challenge transaction that's passed back to MoneyGram at the end of the transaction flow is signed by that account. So this is the additional signature that is included on the challenge that ties not only the user to, to the, uh, the token issued, but also the wallet. Um, and this is what we call client domain attribution. It can be used not just for reporting and knowing what wallet is interacting with your with MoneyGram service, but MoneyGram could feasibly uh, change the fees, although right now everything is free, uh, but MoneyGram could alter their fees or have some kind of promo promotion for a specific wallet by identifying the client domain that's passed them authentication. Um, and at the end of the day, when things are, when the token is issued, that token is still scoped to the user, uh, even though the MoneyGram knows the wallet's being involved in that transaction. So once you've authenticated, which is frankly probably the most complex piece of the system, uh, and thankfully the Stellar SDKs that you would use to integrate with MoneyGram uh, go a long way to help in the authentication process. So all that complexity uh, is not as complex when you, when you use the SDKs. So I would heavily recommend doing that, um, although you don't have to. But once you're authenticated, then you move to initiate a transaction. And so it's a little bit, more, uh, a little bit simpler but when you initiate a transaction for withdrawals, uh, you specify basic information about the transaction, uh, such as the asset that you're trying to transact with, which is always going to be USDC in MoneyGram's case, as well as the account that's going to be the source of funds. So when a withdrawal, funds are moving off Stellar into the fiat world. Uh, and so the account that you pass in this request is the, is the source of funds. Um, and this language parameter passed is just the language that MoneyGram is going to render in, the, in their uh, UI uh, in the response. And uh, if you're a custodian uh, or you, you're using an Omnibus account, you should pass the amount um, because you know, if you're a custodian, you probably have your own user interface that the user entered the amount into. Um, and so when you pass that amount to MoneyGram, they can make sure that that same amount is rendered in their, their UI and you don't have any issues with, say, specifying $100 to withdraw in your app. And then when MoneyGram pops up, you specify a different amount, like 110. Um, when you make this request, you're gonna get a response back that indicates that the MoneyGram transaction needs uh, customer information in order to proceed. And it provides a URL that the wallet is then gonna open. It also provides a transaction ID that you can use to, uh, to pull the transaction as it goes through the process. Uh, deposits, deposits are very similar. So you're still using USDC. You still want the, the MoneyGram UI to be in English. You're still passing the amount. Um, and the account in this case is actually not the source of funds, but the destination, right? So in a cash in or a deposit, you're receiving fiat or MoneyGram is receiving fiat at an agent location and uh, sending USDC to the, the user's seller account. So this account parameter is the destination of funds. Um, and the, uh, the memo in the memo ID is actually just an optional parameter. So let's say, um, you know, because theoretically you could actually just not provide these, this memo and this memo ID uh, and cash would still go to the user's Stellar account. But the reason why you may want a memo is to tie that specific transaction uh, that you are initiating here in this request with the payment that you receive on Stellar. Uh, and you could want to do this for a variety of reasons, right? If you have a mobile application and you, you know, have the user initiate a deposit, that deposit record has some kind of item in the UI. And then when you receive a payment, you want to know, oh, this particular on-chain payment was correlated with this item in my UI uh, that I will, uh, and, and you draw that connection and, and show them that that cash has been delivered for that transaction. So uh, once you have that URL, whether it's a withdraw or a deposit, the MoneyGram, uh, the MoneyGram server will return that URL and you open it in your application. This can be done via a web view or an iframe or even like a web browser tab or pop-up, however you want to open up the experience. Um, MoneyGram's UI will, will, will render. And from this point on, there is kind of a black box uh, in terms of uh, visibility you have into the process. The app opens up the URL and from there on out until the pop-up is closed, uh, MoneyGram is handling the user experience. So MoneyGram will collect uh, information like how much you want to cash out if you haven't sent it in the API, uh, as well as uh, where you want to, uh, I'm sorry, actually, so for withdrawals, you don't need to specify a location. 
you can initiate the MoneyGram user experience and cash out anywhere you'd like. If you'd like to cash in, you have to select a, a location um, and that will be chosen in MoneyGram UI as well. But when you're done with the UI, when the user has actually completed the process, they KYC, they've selected the agent location, they're gonna drop off cash, um, and they've you know, provided their ID number and, and all the, the information MoneyGram requires, that's when you're gonna listen for a closed notification. And this closed notification is done uh, using JavaScript. This UI that you've opened in your application is gonna fire a post message call uh, to the parent window. So if you're a web browser, or sorry, if you're a, a website, you're gonna receive this, this post message call. Uh, and this is really just a closed notification, letting you know that MoneyGram has completed uh, their portion of the flow, and you can close the, the pop-up and resume control of the experience. Uh, the body of this notification is on the right-hand side here, uh, and it's gonna have all the information related to the transaction, such as the ID that was returned in the prior, uh, the prior response, but also other information, like the status of the transaction. In this case, it's pending user transfer start, which is just code for, I'm waiting for the user to provide funds. So, um, you know, in the case of a withdrawal, this means that I'm waiting for the user to send a stellar payment to my address. Uh, it also has a more info URL, which is used uh, to check the status of a transaction. So as a wallet, you can either show the transaction status in your UI, um, or if you wanna you know, provide a more fine-grained status to, to your user, you can just reopen the MoneyGram UI to them for that particular transaction, and it'll give you more fine-grained information about the state of the transaction, and MoneyGram uh, can provide whatever information they want in that UI. Um, other than that, it just provides a bunch of you know, amount and asset information, but then at the bottom is the, the really important piece here. You see this withdraw anchor account address and the withdraw uh, memo. And this is, the, this is the address in the memo that you're gonna to attach to the payment transaction when you send funds to MoneyGram. And this is critically important because if you send it to the wrong address, obviously it's not reaching MoneyGram. But if you also include the wrong memo, MoneyGram will not know that the payment that you sent is correlated to the transaction that you've initiated uh, via API. So this memo is how uh, funds are routed to MoneyGram, but also for that specific transaction that you've initiated in the app. So, and also, you know, for deposit, uh, this information won't be there, right? Because in a deposit case, there's no, you, you are not sending USDC to MoneyGram, MoneyGram is sending USDC to you. Uh, so it, this piece of information is only relevant to withdrawals. Okay, so now that we've initiated the transaction, we've completed the MoneyGram UI, the user's KYC'd, uh, and we're waiting for funds to be dispersed, we need to send or receive USDC. So let's talk about sending USDC, and this is relevant in the withdrawal case, or the cash out case. Um, sending or submitting transactions to the network can be a complicated uh, undertaking, and it depends on your requirements as a business. Uh, but I put some guidelines up here that will help you avoid 99% of the problems. Um, and, and then and the first one, and most important one, is to set a reasonable max fee. So when I say a reasonable max fee, I mean set the fee that you as a business are willing to pay until it no longer becomes economically viable to provide this service. So, you know, funds, or sorry, fees on Stellar are extremely low, usually, you know, a hundredth or you know, a thousandth of a dollar. Um, even less than that. But the network can spike in terms of, uh, in terms of high congestion when, uh, when the network, network is really busy. And so you don't wanna have any kind of temporary service outages during these spikes. Uh, and as long as you provide a high offer, uh, that means you are willing to pay a lot in these spikes, uh, you will uh, still get included in a transaction, not experience any outage. Um, but obviously this is a business decision. So if you're willing to uh, temporarily pause your service or at least pause the settlement of the service until fees come down, then that's completely up to you. Um, and that's really where it comes down to setting a max fee. But again, this is a max fee. So if you've offered to pay one lumen for every payment, which is a pretty high offer, you still will never pay one lumen per transaction. Uh, as long as the network is operating normally and there's not a lot of congestion. Um, it's only in, in those spikes where you may pay that max fee. So Stellar doesn't always charge you the fee that you offer. You're just gonna pay the fee that is necessary to get included in the ledger. 
The next important thing to attach to a transaction is a timeout. So when you submit a transaction to Stellar and you don't include a timeout, there's actually no guarantees of when your transaction is going to be included. But if you don't include a timeout, then you're kind of on the hook indefinitely. So let's say I want to make a payment from, from me to another person and I don't include a timeout in my transaction and I'm sending, you know, I don't know, something significant like, you know, $100 or $1,000. Um, if I don't include a timeout and my fee isn't enough to get included immediately, well, then I don't know if my transaction is going to go through now, if it's going to go through tomorrow, uh, and I have to make sure that I have enough funds in my account in order to fulfill that payment. Uh, so that's why it's always important to include a timeout because you have some sense of determinism. So if, you know, for example, your fee you offered is too low, um, at least when you submitted the transaction, you can time out uh, in a, you know, say like in 10 seconds. And if you did time out, you know that your fee is not competitive enough and you can raise your fee. Um, so this is kind of how fees and timeouts are related is you can set a time where you can reevaluate the environment and decide whether or not you need to lower or raise your fee. Um, obviously, I touched on this in the previous slide, but you must attach a memo when you choose to pay MoneyGram because that's going to allow MoneyGram to route the payment that you sent to the transaction record that you initiated in the server. Uh, if you get a 504, this is effectively Stellar telling you that they couldn't include the transaction right away, but your payment is pending. And this is a common misconception or common mistake that developers make is that 504 or 500 of any kind usually communicates that something's wrong with the service. Uh, this is a bit of a design, uh, a bit of a unique design here, but 504 just means that your transaction is pending. So if you get a 504, just maybe with some, uh, with some exponential back off to make sure you're not getting rate limited, just resubmit the transaction. Don't reconstruct a transaction, but just send the same transaction that you submitted the first time to get an updated status. And if you've provided a timeout, you'll eventually get either a timed out expiration, you'll get a 400 saying your transaction was timed out, or you'll get a 200 success saying that your payment finally was included in the ledger. Um, but don't fail or, or raise an error in your application if you get a 504. This is completely normal behavior. Um, if you do get a, uh, a timeout or, the, or your, your max fee is insufficient, this will come back to you as a you know, TX insufficient fee error or a TX too late error. This is when you need to reevaluate whether or not to raise your fee. So you can rebuild the transaction because the transaction you did submit had timed out and is no longer valid. But you should rebuild the transaction, maybe with a different fee, and resubmit. And then obviously, if you are you know, taking significant advantage of the, the Public Horizon instance that the Stellar Development Foundation hosts, you may get some 429s, which just indicates that you need to be rate limited and you should uh, wait a few moments before submitting another request to the server. Uh, and this will be communicated to you by a 429 status. Receiving payments is a little bit simpler. Uh, instead of hitting a, an endpoint on the Horizon API, you're actually just going to stream payments from a Horizon API. So, uh, if you're an Omnibus, if you're using an Omnibus account or you're a custodian, then you're only going to stream payments from one particular account. So, and it's pretty simple. You'll just hit an, an endpoint, the payments endpoint, using the stream argument, and you'll receive updates using our Stellar SDK whenever payments are made inbound or outbound to your account. If you're using individual accounts, say you're a non-custodial wallet, this is a little bit trickier because you can't, using the Stellar, uh, using the Horizon API, you can't stream from many accounts. You can only stream from all payment or stream from all accounts or a single account. So if you're using a, a non-custodial model, then you're probably going to need to stream all accounts and filter the payments using the, uh, in those all accounts, stream, uh, or sorry, filter using the payments or sorry, using the accounts that uh, are relevant to, to your application. Um, and because you're streaming, you're using a persistent connection uh, to, to the Horizon server. And if this persistent connection fails, either using some networking error or if your service goes down and you need to reestablish the connection, you need to make sure that you didn't miss any payments. And that's why it's important to persist the, the payment cursor uh, that's returned in every payment notification that you get in your stream. So let's say I received a payment uh, from, from MoneyGram and, uh, and then my service went down. Uh, if I saved the payment that I last received, I can use that same payment ID as a cursor when I reestablish my stream 
and I'll get all the payments directly after that, that payment that I specified, ensuring that I'm not gonna miss a payment and uh, ultimately never leave my user in the dark and uh, make it look like they never received a payment when really they did. Um, so for Omnibus accounts, uh, these, these memos um, are gonna, so let's say you're, you're a custodial application, right? And you initiated a deposit with, uh, with MoneyGram. Because you're a custodial uh, application and you're receiving all your deposits into one account, you need a method for identifying the user that those funds need to be credited to when MoneyGram sends those funds. And that's why uh, you need to use a memo to, to map those users to, your, uh, to, to the payment that you receive in your Omnibus account. So all the way back in the, uh, in the initiate transaction step, this memo that you're providing in the request is the memo that MoneyGram is gonna use to send uh, funds to, to your address. And so when you receive those, those payments, you can use that memo that you sent in the request to map to the user uh, in your application that should be credited to those funds. Okay, now we're in the final stages where funds have been settled and we're gonna complete a transaction. The, the really the only thing that you need to do uh, is just fetch the transaction's reference number. And this is only gonna be relevant um, in, uh, in withdrawals. So in a withdrawal case, when you cash out, MoneyGram is gonna provide you a reference number and the user goes to the cash agent and provides that reference number to the agent and that's how they're able to understand what uh, transaction you've initiated and how much you should be, uh, how much you should be picking up. Uh, in a deposit case, this isn't necessary. Uh, this is already logged into their systems, and so you don't need a reference number. You just go to the location that you specified in the application, and you uh, drop off your cash. Um, when you do give the, that reference number, you're just gonna pull the transactions endpoint uh, as a wallet to make sure that the status is being updated in your application. So they've re MoneyGram has, has received funds, and the, uh, and the wallet is checking the status uh, and once that is marked as complete, uh, you'll know that the user has received their payment. Um, and if you don't want to pull, MoneyGram will soon be, soon be implementing callbacks. Uh, so instead of periodically pulling MoneyGram's transactions API, uh, you'll receive a request to your own server indicating that uh, the funds have been dispersed and the, the status has been updated. And this is just more of the same, but uh, you know, you always want to monitor for errors, right? So, uh, or for refunds. So if, you know, funds, let's say the user never goes off, goes to a MoneyGram location and never drops off cash. Um, in this case, uh, at, at some point, the transaction is going to be expired and you're going to want to make sure that you update the status of the payment in your own UI uh, that this payment has been expired. Uh, in the same way, if they're, they're cashing out and that you've sent USDC to, to MoneyGram in order to cash out, but the user never goes and picks up cash, then MoneyGram is gonna refund the payment. And so you'll wanna make sure that that status is reflected in your UI as well. All this is to say that uh, do not stop polling the status of your transaction until you see a completed or a refunded or expired status. These are the three terminal uh, statuses and at that point the transaction is considered final. So this is a lot of information. I recognize that there's a lot of detail, especially depending on whether or not you're a custodial wallet or you're, you're a non-custodial wallet. Uh, but the good news is that the Stellar Development Foundation is trying to make this as easy as possible uh, for you to integrate. Uh, we have a guide where a lot of the material I've gone over in this presentation is in written form. Uh, and in that article are a plethora of resource, uh, resource links. So for example, the Stellar Development Foundation runs their own CEP24 server, um, which is in almost every single way uh, compatible and identical to MoneyGram's service. So if you haven't uh, gone through KYB with MoneyGram yet and you don't have access to their APIs, you can still develop your solution by connecting to Stellar's own reference server of the same standard. Um, you can also look at the demo wallet, which connects to this, uh, this reference server and look at what the demo wallet does and design your application uh, to do the same behavior. Um, and then finally, when all else fails, you can obviously go to the standard specification. So the Stellar Ecosystem Protocol 24 is what MoneyGram implements on the server side and it's what you're gonna implement on the client side. So if you guys have any questions that isn't, uh, that isn't found in this documentation, you can obviously go to the specification and MoneyGram is compliant with, with all the, the specifications there. 
Okay, so that completes the, uh, the conversation uh, and the presentation. If you wanna talk more about this, I have a brain date uh, session at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, so I'll be there and you can sit down and we can, we can talk more, uh, more deeply about Moneygram and integration or, or your specific challenges. Uh, also, I'm on Discord uh, and you can obviously reach me via email at jake.stellar.org. Uh, and thank you. I have about 13 minutes left, so I'll take some questions too if you have any. Sorry, can we, can we wait for the, the mic? Sorry, a very simple question. Who generates the memo for the Omnibus account? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I feel like I kind of sped up on, on that part, but um, the, the answer is both, depending on the, uh, whether or not it's a deposit or a withdrawal. So if it's a withdrawal and you're moving funds from Stellar to the fiat world, then MoneyGram is the one that provides the memo because they're the ones that need to map the payment that's sent to the user that needs to cash out. In the deposit case, it's the wallet that's receiving the payment and it's the wallet that needs to map that payment to the user. So in the deposit case, the wallet sends the memo to MoneyGram and MoneyGram uses that memo on the transaction when they send it to the user. Yeah. Uh, this is very interesting. I have like uh, very like tough experience with this that uh, awesome experience because I'm Argentinian I'm actually living here in Italy and through vibrant I'm using the SDF and MoneyGram integration and I moved to a very small town like in the south of Italy um, from Argentina uh, to withdraw um, euros it was almost one-to-one -one, of course they taking advantage with this uh, like war situation with this, with the economy, what is going on. But the only thing, this is more related, like the user, uh, by the way, thank you, Jesse, that uh, allowed me to, I know you're over there. <laughs> um, um, there is, uh, it was something from the functional thing, uh, not from the tech part, like the experience was amazing. So congrats for everything you guys built. Um, but when I went to the, in, here in Italy, it's, it's called like the Postale Italiana. It's the place uh, in which uh, I can cash out. Uh, they, they didn't understand uh, that it was my self account and I sent the money to my account as well. It's anything from the tech side or something to be considered in the near future that maybe this, because I, I was very close to get uh, like uh, refuse the transaction because after they understood that it was like, okay, this is like his own account, and then he sent it to his own account as well. Uh, I don't know if it's something that I can be done from the tech side. Thank you. So the, the short answer is there's not much from the tech side that we can do. Uh, the reality is that MoneyGram operates a global agent uh, network, and you know this network is managed and run by, by people that um, you know, are not MoneyGram employees. So there's a whole you know, education process that MoneyGram is in, in the process of doing right now um, and making sure that their agents understand what we're trying to do here. Um, so there is no technical uh, solution to that um, other than you know, better communication with the agents. Um, and as you know, this product becomes more, uh, more popular and more common, especially as not only this product becomes more common, but as more you know, e-money applications built on top of MoneyGram's APIs become more common. This is something that the agents will become more familiar with. So I, I suspect this will improve over time, but in, in the medium term, it's going to take some, exp uh, some explaining. Okay, thank you. Um, is it possible also to cash out um, USDC that aren't uh, uh, caching by the same uh, platform? So if I, as a company, I am able to do the caching of the uh, USDC in a country where uh, MoneyGram didn't do the caching, I can use the MoneyGram uh, uh, to cash out in another country where it is uh, available or not? Absolutely. 
as long as the application you're using has uh, that, that capability, then you can cash in somewhere and cash out somewhere else. You can use different applications to do it. You can use you know, Lobster to cash in, and you can use Vibrant to cash out. Um, it really is completely interoperable and you don't have to have any kind of consistency across the app, uh, the app you use. Each transaction is atomic. Did I, did I answer your question or? Um, I think yes, only to clarify, um, if, I, if I cash in without the MoneyGram Access API oh, okay. and I want to cash out with the MoneyGram Access API. Absolutely, you can do that. Yeah, in fact, that's really what we're seeing the, the vast majority of, of usage today is, is folks who get you know, USDC, or not even USDC, maybe they, they bought XLM some, some time ago. They trade it for USDC on the start of a centralized exchange and then cash out through MoneyGram. Uh, MoneyGram doesn't know, you don't have to cash in in order to cash out. Um, and each transaction is individual, completely independent. Hello, hello. Uh, so is there, I was talking to someone earlier and they um, were saying that there's a is there a waiting list to join this? Can you move quickly if we wanted to put this into our app? Because if you've got the developers to rock and roll and get going, to how quickly can this move? So this is uh, really a conversation that each wallet needs to have with MoneyGram. We, at the Star Development Foundation has been you know, a partner of MoneyGram in implementing this, this technology and guiding them through the process of doing so. But when it comes to the legal agreements and the business agreements that you have with MoneyGram, this is something that the SDF can, can help organize, but it, ultimately this is a conversation uh, and a decision by, by MoneyGram and the wallet. So I can't promise any, any timeline, but um, this is really up to MoneyGram's compliance review uh, and their, uh, their comfortability with you know, the speed at which they're onboarding. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Mon Alicia is here. She's uh, really the, the the owner of this project on the MoneyGram side, and uh, I'm happy that she's pitching in. So I'm actually going to punt it back over to Est, but Tom's over there. <laughs> He's kind of managing the funnel as it comes in. This is a new process for us, so we're we're kind of learning as we go. Um, we also have partners like Wire that you can integrate with now. So um, if you want to reach out to Tom, he's right there too. Yeah, so to provide some, some more context around that, um, you know, there, there is a business called Wire. I think Jamal's here. Yes. So, uh, so Wire is, is a business that is connected to MoneyGram, uh, but they, they are not an, an end user application in, a, in themselves. Uh, their whole business model is to be um, a connector from MoneyGram to other applications. Um, and so Wire has done the KYC and due diligence and the KYB with MoneyGram and other mobile applications. If you want to connect through Wire, uh, you can onboard through Wire. Uh, so this is one way in which we've tried to streamline the process. And they don't charge fees. Um, any other questions? Who decides which countries the cash out can happen can be limited, or do you get all 200, or what with money? Gram? Uh, sorry, can you, can you repeat that? So for cash out countries, does app decide which countries cash out will work, or you get all 200 um, countries, or whichever? Yes, so long as you're like wanting to do business there. Yeah. It, cash out is global, is what, the way I yeah. say it. Yeah. Like if you didn't want to be in a, in a certain country, could we, we could turn it off for you. Yeah, so cash out is a lot uh, more available. So obviously it's not every country, but you can effectively cash out in, in almost every country in the world. Cash in is restricted to I think 14 right now, um, but that list is growing and it's really a, a, a function of, of technology. A lot of the technology in these agent locations across the world um, is, is not set up for the type of transaction that's being facilitated in the, in the countries that do support cash in currently. 
Uh, and so this is a process that MoneyGram is working through, but um, ultimately we'll expand. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.